不思議のダンジョン、風来の試練、トグロジマ探検録、is a true roguelike role playing game that was released in Japan and Taiwan on January 25th, 2024, exclusively for the Nintendo Switch by publisher and developer Spike Chunsoft. There haven't been any announcements yet about bringing the game to other platforms, but it's highly likely that it will be ported somewhere down the line. Thankfully, however, there are plans to publish it in North American and European markets on February 27th under the title Shiren the Wanderer, the Mystery Dungeon of Serpent Coil Island. Quite the mouthful of a title. Described as a game you can play a thousand times, this is the latest entry in the prolific Mystery Dungeon series, a franchise that spans over three decades now, starting with Dragon Quest's spin off, Torneco's Big Adventure, in 1993. Aside from Dragon Quest, the Mystery Dungeon games have also been set in the Final Fantasy and Pokemon universes, but Shiren is its own original IP that began all the way back in the 16 bit era, more specifically 1995 in the Nintendo Super Famicom. That was the first Shiren the Wanderer game, and this latest is the sixth mainline title in a series with many side adventures. What makes this specific Shiren game extra special, though, is that it's the first completely new entry in 14 long years. Yes, over a decade. Although a Shiren game came out on the Switch and PC in 2020, Shiren the Wanderer, The Tower of Fortune, and The Dice of Fate, another mouthful of a title. That was actually a port of a PS Vita game from 2016, which in turn was a port of a Nintendo DS game from 2010. So, an enhanced port of an enhanced port. And when Tower of Fortune was released on the DS in Japan in 2010, it was titled Furai no Shiren 5. While nowhere near as big as Dragon Quest, Final Fantasy, or Pokemon, the Shiren the Wanderer and Mystery Dungeon titles have been a staple in Japanese gaming over the years, particularly with handheld systems. So, with Shiren finally embarking on a new adventure after all this time, there was a considerable amount of buzz surrounding this release in Japan. I bought the game on launch day at my local electronics shop, the largest in the area, and all copies sold out that very day. A few days later, I saw that it had sold out at a game store nearby as well, and Serpent Coil Island got absolutely glowing praise from Weekly Famitsu, the nation's most widely read gaming magazine. And yeah, how nice is it to say widely read gaming magazine in 2024? Nearly 40 years and running, baby. So has the long road to a new Shiren game been worth the wait? After putting nearly 50 hours into it, my short answer? Absolutely. And is Shiren the Wanderer, the mystery dungeon of Serpent Coil Island, the next big step in the evolution of the Fujigi no Dungeon series? Well, not really. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. We'll get to it. With this review, I aim to give newcomers to the series or these kinds of games, as well as long term fans, an idea of what Shiren 6 brings to the table, and whether or not it's the kind of game they might want to invest their time and money into. This is coming from someone who is a fan of the games, but not an expert or super hardcore roguelike maniac. Ever since the days of Chocobo's Mysterious Dungeon 2 on the original PlayStation, though, I've played a few mystery dungeon titles here and there, including some of the Shiren ones, so I'm familiar with the games and their mechanics enough to where I'm fairly confident I can give at least a halfway informed opinion of this new game. This will be a largely spoiler free review, at least when it comes to the story. I'll break things down by going through the story setup and basic gameplay mechanics, the finer points of gameplay, its online features, graphics and music, and the good, the bad, and the final verdict. Grab some rice balls because our journey starts now. The game begins with the silent protagonist Shiren and his speaking ferret companion Koppa doing what they do best wandering the land. They encounter a group of destitute, starving locals, and being the good guys they are, they share with them their entire stash of delicious rice balls. This brings their spirits up, as food tends to do on an empty stomach, and they explain why they are so downtrodden. A lack of rain for a long period of time has prevented them from growing anything on the land. A legend says the fox god Kokatsu once chased away the clouds in a fit of rage, and so at this moment, the god is angry, which is why the rains won't come. Despite the dire situation, these people will try their best to make do thanks to the wanderer and his furry friend, but will also offer some of the rice balls to Kokatsu in an attempt to quell his anger. 
The two continue on their journey, heading toward a small island called Togorojiba, the titular Serpent Coil Island, where the promise of a hidden store of valuable pirate treasure has lured those brave souls with a sense of adventure and discovery to its shores. And apparently a greater prize is also up for grabs, but it's unfortunately said to be located in the belly of a terrible monster residing deep in the heart of the island. Since these are just rumors, the duo only halfway believed this tale, until the day they had a vivid dream about the monster, as well as a damsel in distress crying out for a helping hand. Is this young woman the treasure the rumors refer to? Whatever the case, Shiden and Kopa make their way to Serpent Coil Island to save the girl and save the day, and procure a potentially prodigious payday. Mystery dungeon titles aren't known for really fleshed out deep tales, and story often takes a backseat to the gameplay, though Shiden 6 does focus more on storytelling than many of its peers and predecessors. It's not as narrative driven as, say, the third game on Wii and PSP, but in addition to the main storyline, there are a lot of side story threads that introduce the player to the colorful adventurers that have come to Serpent Coil Island, including some familiar fan favorite faces, but also some new guys, girls, and pig guys that help make the world Chiden inhabits much more fun and interesting. Completion of these side stories also has major implications on how one plays the game. We'll get into that a little later. After a couple more short story segments, which we won't go over just because I'm trying to keep this as spoiler free as possible, Shiden 6 throws the players right into the action. If you've played the last Shiden release, Tower of Fortune, or just about any other mystery dungeon game, you'll feel right at home here. The tried and true formula of the series hasn't changed much over the years, and that still stands with this latest game. If you haven't played a mystery dungeon game before, however, you might find yourself becoming confused and frustrated soon after playing since there is no tutorial and the difficulty is more punishing than other titles, particularly in the early stages. Let's go over a bit of the game's fundamentals from here. Shiden has to make his way through dungeons that are procedurally generated, with enemy placement, traps, and items completely randomized and different with each playthrough. Movement takes place on an unseen grid and combat is turn-based, with one action typically taking up a single turn for the hero and for enemies, except when speed is affected by status ailments, equipment, or consumables. Although this game is called The Mystery Dungeon of Serpent Coil Island, it is in fact made up of many smaller dungeons, with each area described as a floor regardless of verticality. Getting to the mysterious beauty and menacing beast of Shiden and Kopa's dreams means trudging through 31 quote-unquote floors. This journey starts off on the shores of the island and continues on through a variety of locales, such as lush forests, volcanic mountainsides, and frigid caves of ice. Shiren must survive all sorts of dangers that lay in his path as he traverses the diverse terrain, desperately searching for the way to the next floor. Defeating monsters means gaining experience, which means leveling up, which of course means a boost in player stats, a gold standard feature of RPGs. Survival isn't as simple as making sure HP stays above zero though, since hunger also plays a factor when out wandering the world, something implemented from the very first Shiren the Wanderer game. Any action taken, as well as taking damage, will drain Shiden's hunger. As long as the hunger meter is above zero, HP will regenerate slightly every turn. When hunger hits zero, the opposite takes place and Shiden starts losing HP with each action. Consuming food items, typically rice balls, will greatly satiate a traveler with an empty stomach, though herbs and other restoratives will also stave off the pangs of hunger, if only slightly. And since we're talking about all these items, let's also talk about another major factor that determines survival, inventory management. Shiren only has enough room on his person to carry 24 items. One item takes up one slot, no matter how big or small they'd be perceived in reality. So that means a large sword takes up the same space as a solitary arrow. However, arrows and rocks are a slight exception to the rule as they can be bundled together to use up only a single spot. The only other exception to this rule is by bringing along pots, a major characteristic of the Shiren the Wanderer series. Depending on the pot, several items can be stored and carried on the journey, taking up just one slot in Shiren's inventory. Standard pots allow you to freely insert and take out items, and other types may require you to smash them to gain access. There are many varieties of pots that have special uses as well. Some pots might convert your items into Giton, the currency of Shiren 6. Some might send them back to your warehouse in the starting town area, while others will transform them into completely different objects, useful or not so useful. There are some that even allow you to hide from enemies for a time or heal you. Not all the effects are positive though, so there is a bit of a risk reward factor when using pots. Some might just end up killing you. However, to do well in later levels of the dungeon, it's almost essential to get used to pots.
The kinds of items you'll need to effectively collect and utilize include weapons, shields, accessories, magic rods, magic scrolls, herbs to recover life or status, as well as to inflict harm on enemies, food, anything and everything to avoid what the Mystery Dungeon series is arguably most famous, or should I say infamous for, death. death. From the very first Mystery Dungeon title, the consequences for death have been extremely unforgiving. It's the classic, get sent back to the hub village, revert to level 1, all items lost forever formula that fans of roguelikes and this series specifically have come to know and love. In Shiren 6, you will die, and die and die again. And you will be frustrated, time and time again. In the words of the great Benjamin Franklin, in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death, getting pissed off while playing a mystery dungeon game, and taxes. I'm pretty sure he said that he was a smart guy. But anyway, while it does suck to essentially have to start all over again each time you die, the player does gain something essential to conquering Serpent Coil's dungeons. Knowledge. And not knowledge of how to repair broken controllers, though you may gain that as well. Knowledge of enemy types and attack patterns, knowledge of tactics and how to handle tricky situations, knowledge of the plethora of items you're bound to come across on your next playthrough. And you don't have to have an eidetic memory or a notebook to scribble in, though both do help, since Shiren 6 keeps track of all the enemies, equipment, status, ailments, and traps you've seen. Whatever it is, you can take a look in your journey records and find what you need. If that isn't enough, while there isn't a tutorial section or area like in other Shiren games, there is a player's manual that can be accessed at any time as well as the newly introduced Monster Dojo, which lets players practice fighting against any beast, ghoul, or adorable mascot character with any set of objects and arms and on different types of terrain, provided they've been recorded in the travel log. These are all the basics of gameplay that should be understood and mastered in order to see the game's conclusion. However, there are other features that will aid players in their attempts, some that will be familiar to veterans, but some new to this entry as well. Very minor story and gameplay spoilers ahead, be warned. Like its predecessors, Shiren 6 is at its core an unfair game. Let's say you're on a lucky run and early on you acquire some great weapons and armor, gather a stockpile of rice bowls and herbs to last two journeys, and manage to avoid stepping on some of the more nasty traps. Amazing, wonderful, consider yourself blessed by the RNG gods. Though no matter how many blessings come your way, the odds always seem stacked against you, particularly when starting off at a fresh level 1 with nothing but a rice ball to your name. Here comes a new challenger! That might sound like a major negative, but for fans of this series and this style of game, it's one of its most appealing aspects, making the experience one of perpetual intensity, constantly forcing players to think ahead in and out of dungeons and carefully react to each and every situation that comes their way. Luck is a big factor, but there are a few other things you can do aside from simply get good that will make your time on Serpent Coil Island less hellish. First off, it's a good idea to take any opportunity to progress through the story. Early on, each new playthrough brings with it opportunities to meet new characters and view main and side story events. Typically, these take place in small settlements or clearings in between dungeons. It will take several runs to finish these storyline threads, and the rewards are worth seeing them through to the end. One of the first things players are bound to unlock in Shiren 6 are secret alternate routes. These extra dungeons provide a sidetrack off the beaten path, allowing you to skip some of the dungeons in the normal route, promising not only some welcome variety and scenery, but also better loot in exchange for tougher enemies. There is only one other real downside to the alternate dungeon paths, which is related to Shiren 6's online features, so wait just a little bit for that. Side stories also open up additional dungeons that are unlike the alternate paths and that they revert the player back to level 1. These extra stages are quite challenging and come with some sort of unique gimmick, one example being a 40 floor dungeon that is host to a lot of shops and most force the player to start with a completely clean slate by not allowing any items to be brought along, dish out tougher enemies and deadlier traps, and obscure the names of much of the loot requiring appraisal or trial and error to discover what they are. These are not for adventurers who are faint of heart. Going through side stories is also how Shiden gains new companions that will fight alongside him when out exploring mysterious dungeons. One of these is the wandering swordswoman Asuka, who has shown up in other Shiden games and even had her own spin-off on the Dreamcast. 
and there were several new additions to the series like the adventurers Hibiki and Tugai, captains of the Red Orca Pirates and Black Shark Pirates, respectively. While exploring dungeons, other travelers may appear somewhere on random floors. These may be NPCs such as merchants or people who want to trade items with you, but after recruiting a character through the story, they may also show up and offer to join Shiren from that point onward. Each of these allies make a big impact on the odds of successfully completing the current dungeon, and have unique attack styles and behavior patterns. For example, similar to her other appearances, Asuka is quite powerful but lacks a weapon and shield. Toss her a set though and she'll immediately equip them. And young Hibiki makes use of items to increase her speed, inflict monsters with status ailments, and even heal the heroes sometimes when things are looking grim. Shiren's friends tend to be a bit on the fragile side and can be defeated rather quickly, so it's a good idea to keep them out of harm's way as much as possible, because once they're gone, they won't show up again until the next run. It also doesn't matter how many levels they gain, since their stats are reset on new runs anyway, based on how deep into the dungeon they're found. Leveling up Shiren is one way to increase his HP, but as veteran players already know, consuming certain healing items while HP is completely filled will increase maximum hit points slightly. The same is true with the hunger meter and food. However, a new feature in Shiren 6 rewards players who are able to eat their way to a hunger level of 150 points. When this happens, the game goes into Doskoi mode, appropriately named Sumo mode in the English release, where Shiren becomes quite girthsome, receiving a significant boost in strength and HP, and gaining the ability to crush any trap he walks over. He can also smash through walls like the Incredible Hulk or the Kool-Aid Man, pick your stupid reference. Fat is rule. However, there are a few setbacks to plumping up like this that are completely unrelated to blood pressure and cholesterol problems, such as not being able to take advantage of movement magic or herbs, not getting to enjoy the effects of any of the few helpful traps, and having hunger go down at a faster rate. Once hunger hits 120, Shiden returns to his normal, non-fatty form, losing a small amount of his max hunger points in the process. Shiren is not the only one to get supersized in this new game either, as it introduces giant monsters called Dekkai, renamed behemoths in English releases. In some dungeon floors, a portal appears where these slow-moving, gargantuan enemies emerge from. They are guarded by a formation of five flames in front, leaving them vulnerable only in the rear with standard attacks, and they pack a hell of a powerful punch, usually able to knock out poor Shiren in one hit. The most common strategy for dealing with these giants is to simply run away, since after a set amount of turns they'll disappear and the portal will move to another room. If you can enter all rooms on a floor, the portals and behemoths will disappear for good. Though there is one extremely effective way to deal with this new menace head on and it's surprisingly simple. Tossing stones. Yep, throwing a rock goes right over their fiery barriers and lands right on their head. And despite their impressive size and strength, their HP levels are laughable, and a single stone with the set amount of damage it deals is enough to fell the titans, a veritable David and Goliath situation. Another new feature found in Shiden 6 are rare weapons and shields that glow with a blue or golden light. These are sacred treasures, equipment that have higher stats and more rune slots on average than what you typically stumble upon, which may be embedded with especially rare runes, and also include some inherent special effects that aren't listed in their descriptions. The rune stuff is a particularly big deal, as their effects can include anything from blocking most magic attacks or slowing the rate at which the hunger meter drains, to adding critical or extra attacks per swing, or greatly increasing damage to certain enemy types, to a whole encyclopedia of other outcomes. These sacred arms have the potential to be the best equipment in the game, and coming across them always seems like a big deal with the shing sound effect that plays when discovering one. While they are quite rare, they can be found randomly in any dungeon, purchased from vendors, or rewarded after completing a dungeon, and you're bound to come across one eventually, especially at later stages of the game. Going back to side stories, completing some of them also unlocks new gameplay features and items, an early example being one of the only ways to improve weapons and shields, the Synthesis Pod, which can merge equipment to increase stats and combine runes. This useful item is something that can be found at pretty much any time in previous Shiden games, but is added to the mix quite late in the main story dungeon. In fact, many standard items or features of the mystery dungeon in Shiden games are unavailable at first and take some time and effort to unlock. To experience what the game truly has to offer, you'll have to complete the initial 31 floor dungeon of Serpent Coil Island and vanquish the fearsome creature from the hero's dreams. Beating this boss in dungeon gives the player a relatively satisfying ending and end credit sequence, and it can be argued that the true mystery dungeon experience only begins afterward. The starting hub town's features and services finally open up completely, 
letting players easily store items and money, fast travel to select areas and dungeons, and perform maintenance on equipment, among other things. You can even begin to raise and care for monster babies that will randomly show up in dungeons, giving the player a useful item for the road. And the main story continues on, with more characters and twists introduced, including one surprise that I will show but not tell about. Ooh, how mysterious and cute. There is really so much to do in this game, and so much I haven't even talked about, in the interest of either keeping the review spoilers to a minimum or keeping the review under an hour. And I'm sure there's important stuff I just forgot. And we haven't even gotten to the online modes. Well, until now. Like Shiren 4 and 5, falling in a dungeon without a revival herb doesn't automatically send you back to the starting village. Instead, you have the choice of sending out a request for help online, up to three times per journey. The only exception to this is when going through one of the alternate routes mentioned earlier. Not being able to send for help is one of the conditions that make taking those paths more risky. When sending out an SOS, you are taken to a menu screen where you can do one of several things, the most important of which is actually sending out your petition to be rescued. This generates a special ID that can be searched online in case you want to be helped by a specific friend or acquaintance, but any random player can answer the call and rescue you. The rescuing process recreates the dungeon of the fallen player with the same layout, enemies, and loot, and the savior must make it to the floor where the distressed journeyman met his or her untimely demise. The player is saved once the rescuer is able to extend a helping hand, and only after contending with a room full of monsters. Aside from feeling good about aiding a fellow wanderer in need, points for use in this online mode are awarded, more points for rescues that take place deeper in the dungeon, and some extra points given for things such as collecting items and money. If one fails to save the adventurer, the attempt is not a complete waste, as some bonus points are rewarded regardless of success. Unfulfilled requests expire after 7 days, and if you don't want to wait around for help, there are a couple of things you can do aside from just giving up and starting over. One of these is attempting to save yourself under the same conditions listed previously. It might seem like a silly idea to play through the same dungeon all over instead of just trying again from scratch, but in case you were carrying something particularly special or rare on you, such as an upgraded sacred weapon or shield, it's an avenue worth considering. You could also try your hand at saving other players and rack up those points we talked about since they can be spent on little power-ups to help increase the chances of a successful rescue. I was able to find a lot of people to help out in this online mode, and was even helped out myself a few times. However, any calls for rescue from really deep in the main dungeon or one of the nastier optional dungeons will probably fall on deaf ears. And that's because the only rewards are the aforementioned points. No items or money collected from these rescue missions can be kept, unfortunately. On the second day of the game's release, I had trouble connecting to the server, most likely due to a high volume of players, but thankfully there are some pre-made rescue missions for anyone playing offline who wants to collect points. The other online feature in Shiren 6 is called Parallel Play, which at first sounds like some kind of cool co-op or multiplayer mode, and it kind of is, but is probably quite different from what you're thinking. What it allows you to do is upload any point in your journey to the internet for other people to play, and conversely allows you to download other players' data to try out for yourself. It's a fun way to check out different loadouts or try to overcome some really tricky situations. I used it myself to take a peek at later levels and learn what good upgraded equipment looks like, as well as discover that trekking through the dungeons doesn't have to be a lonely romp. Two things that honestly really helped motivate me to continue on when I was struggling a few hours into the game. Like the rescue feature, nothing is really gained from this mode, other than the pure entertainment value. I haven't spent much time with parallel play, but apparently you can make things more social by setting up time and score attack sessions for other players, and additional parallel play data can be created within another's data to keep the challenge going in a relay style manner. Sounds like fun with a good group of people, but unfortunately these online features are apparently region or language locked, limiting the pool of players who can interact with each other. I'm sure the Japanese player base will have some crazy data to upload in the coming months, which is a shame that so many people won't be able to share in the experience.
I'd warrant to guess that at first glance, Shiren 6 probably doesn't look all that great graphically to most modern gamers. It's a rare fully 3D title in the series that at times sort of has that PS2 game look, and some people might think it looks similar to the third title on the Wii and PSP, just with chibi characters and higher resolutions. And while I do have a strong preference for the pixel art style from the other Shiden titles, I think the original game on the Super Famicom has some of the most stunning 16-bit art I've ever seen. If you take a closer look at this newest Shiden, it really is a beautiful game. It's not so much the human or monster character models, but rather the environments that wow. There are small details that are easy to overlook as one searches for loot and exits. The crashing of ocean waves, the slow-moving shadows cast by the sun and clouds, all subtle touches to the presentation that might not be appreciated initially. Admittedly, in general, the dungeons lack a lot of the personality and charm of previous titles. However, the towns and clearings are quite attractive, and the cinematography in the story cutscenes is well done. For what the game is, there's really nothing wrong with the graphics. Sure, they could have been nicer, especially for a Switch game, or they could have been 2D, but they're serviceable and a good fit for this style of game. And when the visuals do shine, they shine brightly. I think Shiren 6's promotional and cover art are quite special. It was actually the game's box art that caught my attention, since I had no idea this game was even in the works and just happened to see it on the shelf of my local electronics shop on launch day. I ended up buying the game right on the spot, but also picked up the Amazon exclusive limited set just because that superb artwork is slapped on a huge box. The art style used for the Shiren games has always been distinctly Japanese, but with the sixth game it's a little more manga and a little less anime, if that makes sense. You get to see more of the artwork by completing in-game achievements, which will often unlock illustrations that will randomly display in some of the backgrounds of game screens, in addition to a handful of skins for the main character. Complementing the Japanese visual aesthetic is its soundtrack, full of awesome tunes straight out of the Far East. Shiren the Wanderer has a long history of excellent soundtracks, Early titles were scored by none other than the late Dragon Quest composer Koichi Sugiyama, and I'm happy to say that this game's music is a worthy and welcome addition to the series. A lot of these tracks will get stuck in your head for days, and not just because you'll hear them so often. They really are just that good. Another thing I want to bring up in this section is the look of the HUD and menus. While it doesn't have much personality, I think this might be the best, most streamlined system in the series. So much information is displayed and available at a glance. The hunger meter is shown prominently with numerical values right under the HP bar, and checking loot is a smoother process than ever, since item descriptions are provided when highlighted, as opposed to having to open up a separate menu to read details like in the past. In previous titles, the map could be quite intrusive, covering up a lot of the action in areas of interest, but here it's never in the way. And now maps also track exactly where Shiden has set foot, making avoiding traps easier than ever when backtracking. There are also a couple of display modes that present a lot of extra information about your current run, surely included for those who plan on streaming the game often. As far as the game's performance goes, there's really no big hiccups, and since it's a turn-based game, it doesn't really matter. However, I should mention that in a few dungeons with certain effects going on, there is a slight feeling of sluggishness that is likely to bother no one. I think for fans of previous Mystery Dungeon games, there's a lot to love with this new release. It likely has most of the things they enjoyed about previous games, includes a few modern features and tweaks that makes gameplay more fast-paced and game progression smoother, has a relatively engaging story with a fun cast of characters new and old, a fantastic soundtrack, and tons and tons of replay value. Shiren 6 prides itself as being a challenging game, and it is that and then some. You'll often find yourself in seemingly unwinnable situations, but just as often you can think of a point in your journey where you could have done something differently to avoid being stuck between a rock and an ultra hard place, whether it was a bad set of moves a few turns previously, or wasting a useful item a floor or two back. It's when you start to get better at planning ahead and learn to read situations in front of you that the game becomes really satisfying. Shiden 6 really is a game you can play a thousand times, as the advertising proclaims, however that's only really if you have the time and patience to put into it. In many ways, the developers of this game attempted to go back to Shiren's roots, crafting an old-school gaming experience in a new-school package. For many, this will be a welcome approach. For so many others though, and especially those new to the series, it could be a huge turnoff. I think titles like Shiren 4 and 5 struck a great balance in gameplay to satisfy longtime fans and curious newcomers in terms of difficulty, at least aside from its nightmarish nighttime segments. 
While Chiden 6 lacks the day and night cycle, it ramps up the difficulty significantly, especially at the first steps of the journey. I don't consider myself a pro mystery dungeon player, but never have I died in the first handful of floors of a Shiden game than I have with 6. That Benjamin Franklin quote from earlier comes to mind. And never had I had a more unlucky time collecting weapons, shields, and rice balls. I've gone 10 floors without finding any equipment in a playthrough, and have starved to death in some dungeons simply because there just wasn't any food to find. It's a noticeable change from previous titles, especially coming off of Tower of Fortune. Another factor ramping up difficulty is the fact that basic items like the aforementioned synthesis pot, as well as the escape scroll, are not available from the start. And in the latter's case, only after the first dungeon is cleared and a somewhat obscure storyline path is taken and a difficult dungeon conquered do you get to use it. And Shiren is likely to be alone on his journey for many hours. I didn't recruit any allies until about 12 hours in, after I beat the first dungeon, which honestly made it more of a fun challenge, however it's something I can see a lot of people just giving up on due to frustration. While its online features are more robust than ever, it still feels like so much more could have been done, and the fact that nothing of substance is gained from it that can be used in the offline game will surely make players less willing to engage with these modes. I get the effort to keep things simple and closer to the original essence of the series, but after all this time, and especially after the great additions and improvements of the last couple of titles, overall it seems like a bit of a wasted opportunity where Shiden takes one step forward, two steps back. That being said however, this is still a polished, well-crafted game that is a fantastic representative of what the mystery dungeon games and roguelikes are all about. I consider myself a fairly casual fan of the series, and while I did list some of the things I perceive as negatives of Shiden 6, the rest of this review should show that I think it's a really good game, one that I've had a blast with so far. And I say so far because even though I've put in a respectable 47 hours into the game, have beaten a bunch of dungeons, and have even maxed out a couple of pieces of gear, I still feel like I've only scratched the surface of what Shiden 6 has to offer. I have no regrets paying full price for this game, and neither did a lot of other people here in Japan. Early adopters and those with pre-orders received one of several bonus items with the game, mainly clear files and a cool oversized lenticular art card. As I mentioned earlier, Amazon offered a limited edition package, well, several different sets actually, and Spike Chunsoft offered their own limited edition through Ebb10 that came with some nice items. I'll probably buy an international version of the game just to show my support, though I'm also curious to see how it gets localized since this Japan release currently is only available in Japanese and Chinese. The game's early success in Japan likely means a new mainline Shiren title might not take 14 years to come out, and I imagine we'll get some kind of DLC for it, paid or otherwise. Fingers crossed. Well anyway, those are my humble thoughts on Shiren the Wanderer, the mystery dungeon of Serpent Coil Island. I originally planned on just doing a short 10 minute first impressions video for this game, but as I was working on that, I decided to scrap it and do a full review just because I like the game so much. I hope you enjoyed this video and consider picking up Spike Chunsoft's latest if it looks like it will tickle that dungeon exploring itch you have. Yeah, that one right there. You know the spot I'm talking about. No need to embarrass you by spelling it out further. This is Jimmy Hoppa, take care, and stop ignoring my rescue requests online.